and I'm seeing more and more of this of uh, the the most of the problems are in the Pacific region. Hawaii is getting planes landing all the time, every day almost. Uh, emergency landings, Guam, other Pacific islands. But of course, because Fukushima is releasing huge amounts of radiation every single day for every day since it's happened, um, the air column of the Pacific is more contaminated than any other area of, of the world. And the highest incident rate of forced landings or emergency landings, crashes and everything is in the United States. And that's because the radiation is coming this way from Japan. Um, and the uh, American um, government has created such an economic disaster in the United States. And Fukushima's had an effect too that our Airplanes, our commercial planes, are not being serviced properly. They're not being maintained. They uh, are stealing, the companies are stealing the pension funds of the employees, then selling the company to another uh, airline company. They're merging, and each time those mergers occur, um, the pension funds are stolen from yet another company of employees. With that corporate name change comes a hand washing. Yes. I want to remind everyone, too, who is not familiar with the releases from the Fukushima accident, that there were 2,000 isotopes, as Lorraine had mentioned earlier, that blew out of those reactors, out of that site, and are continuing to this day. There was an EU study that concluded Fukushima had released 210 quadrillion becquerels of just cesium-137 into the air at the beginning of the accident. And a senior researcher at JMA, Marine Chemistry, had said that 30 billion becquerels of cesium and 30 billion becquerels of strontium are being released into the ocean every day. Yes. And from what we know just about cesium chemistry, cesium reacts rapidly with water. It actually becomes exothermic. And when it combines, it forms cesium hydroxide. Cesium hydroxide has a very strong base and it rapidly etches the surface of not only semiconductors like silicone, but it's very corrosive to glass. And we have historic evidence of this happening during weapons testing. There was a article that appeared in the St. Petersburg Times on April 17th of 1954, following the Castle Bravo hydrogen bomb, which was detonated on March 1st of 1954 at Bikini Atoll in the Marshall Islands. It was the most powerful nuclear device ever detonated by the United States. It was about one-third the energy of the Tsar Bomba, and it had a yield of 15 megatons of TNT. And in the days following, in the weeks following, there were pockmarked windshields that became an international incident because of this nuclear test. And I'll read this directly from the article. Reports of pitted or pockmarked automobile windshields spread south to Olympia, the capital of Washington, and north across the Canadian border to Victoria, British Columbia today. At the same time, the menace appeared to be growing throughout northwest Washington as reports of damaged windshields swamped police switchboards. They had car dealerships that were calling in people who had their cars parked outside and on the streets. Everywhere that there were cars parked, they were having these pockmarked windshields. The police cruisers were noticing the same thing. It said in this article, in investigations into the mysterious phenomenon thus far have not produced an answer to what is causing the windshield suddenly to show up with pits of varying size. Theories range all the way from simply defective glass 
to harmful industrial ash and to fallout of dust from H-bomb tests in the Pacific. In London, they had had a similar outbreak of these pitted windshields over a two-year period, and investigations from, an investigation from the authorities showed what they thought was mass hysteria. <laughs> <laughs> ah, well, they reported as mass hysteria. And you're right, Christine, I've seen the article that you're talking about, and I was looking back through what are called the morgue files at uh, newspapers.com, and I found many other examples of that one, which also reminded me about uh, the car trips we used to go on. I grew up in the 50s. And we used to go out on car trips. And one of the things that I would see in the countryside of Pennsylvania, for instance, and Ohio, that variety of thing, were the roadside signs to come in and see the two-headed cow or the mm -hmm. two-headed chicken or the this or the that. The number of co-joined births that were immortalized in roadside uh, signs in America in the 50s mm -hmm. and the early 60s are staggering. And what I've been doing since Fukushima happened is collecting every story that I can find in the media all over the world that indicates another conjoined twin was born. And this is not just humans, it, it's in animals too. And I've been plotting those on maps. And um, the um, conjoined twinning has always been very, very rare until those are the Siamese twins that, that they would put in traveling circuses and so forth. And uh, basically, pre-1900, pre-actually 1898, is the, um, the pre-human... Uh, man-made uh, radiation period and uh, there is radiation that exists in the environment from minerals in rocks that uh, through sedimentation processes that breaks down they get into rivers and locked it into the air and people it gets into people's bodies and causes birth defects but very 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 rarely and um, when they started bomb testing, they polluted the whole entire planet, including lower orbital space, with man-made radiation. And so the health effects globally have been horrendous, but they've been much higher in the United States because the U.S. government detonated over 1,200 nuclear bomb tests at the Nevada test site. And that radiation uh, contaminated every person in the United States. And there are many families with um, multi-generational now uh, health effects, birth defects, and so on uh, as a consequence of the bomb tests. So when they're talking about bomb tests and nuclear technologies, they're talking about how much the technology costs to build, to mine the radiation, and blah, blah, blah. But no one ever talks about the human cost. And that is much higher than any other dollar and cents amount, which is normally talked about. When they analyzed at the Seattle Police Laboratory this material that was found on the pitted windshields, the chief of police said that the particles were something like the drippings from the end of a soldering iron. So, I mean, if this was doing this to glass, you know, what was it doing to people? What was it doing in the food supply? And, you know, when, whenever you and I have done interviews, whether we're talking about the health effects, excess mortality rates, sickness and cancer, heart attacks and athletes and young people and people that travel a lot, people that fly a lot or, or live on the West Coast, something that always comes up in each interview is you always say, none of this is new. That's right. That's right. All right, should we move on to number three? Yes. Electrical components, Larry? 
Well, it's, it's all part and parcel of the same effects. The effects that you described, the effects, the multiplier effect that tra traveling electricity has in gathering other, uh, attracting other uh, forms of radionuclide and what happens is they're hitting each other, bouncing off of each other, they're pulling energy off of each other and out of the metal and the medium that they're transiting through, that variety of thing. You have to put up more shielding, there's more that you have to do to protect your electronics as you go down the road because the electronics themselves are getting thinner. The, the equation just it all marches in the same direction, and it's in inevitable. It's zero sum. Nanotechnology is a very good example of how electricity or electrical fields or electrical technologies are affected by ionizing radiation, which is what we're talking about. And nanotechnology uh, occurs in projected fields of electricity to um, the building blocks of material, of matter, and those would be atoms. And they project a, uh, an electrical field and they manipulate the atoms in that electrical field to uh, form building blocks that produce very, very tiny particles, a tenth of a micron in diameter or smaller. Now, a human hair is 50 to 80 microns in diameter, if you cut it in half. A tenth of a micron is many times smaller than that. And uh, this is basically what is being released from these nuclear power plants from nuclear weapons, and by the way, they're using many nukes on the battlefield uh, in Iraq, Afghanistan, Lebanon, Gaza, all over the world, and uh, they are exempt from international treaties if they're five kilotons or smaller. Now, I was trained by a, a Manhattan Project scientist, Marion Falk, who made the hydrogen bomb work for the United States government by solving all the problems on it. And uh, he taught me uh, for 10 years in his living room all of this information, how to think about it, how to present it, because he said, I'm opposed to exposing the public to radiation, ionizing radiation, and... I want you to be my spokesperson and go around the world and warn people because I can't do it. Uh, there are many countries he could not even go to if they even let him out of the United States, and he's in his 90s now. So I did that. And um, the, uh, the problem with nanoparticles is they are not subject to the gravitational forces, so they stay suspended in the air permanently until they're rained out or snowed out. And um, the problem with Fukushima and other nuclear technologies that release radiation, this is on the battlefield or for energy or for whatever they're using it for, is that once they get into the atmosphere, 95% uh, are rained or snowed out into the environment in uh, just three months. And with the nuclear bomb tests that injected the radiation high into the atmosphere, 85% of it is still up there. Only 15% of the radiation made it down into our environment. And look at the effects of just 15% to human health and well-being in the United States. 